So let's see, back in 2013, somewhere around then, 2012, 2013, I was at a, a workshop, a huge workshop. It had about 2,000 people in this workshop. And it was a, a seven-day workshop. Uh, a lot of people have probably surely attended this workshop. I'm going to leave it unnamed for now. But I remember there was this, this moment when the workshop facilitator asked all of the men in the audience, all of the men, raise your hand if you have felt unsafe in the last week. Anytime in the last week, you felt unsafe. Uh, I did not raise my hand. And I think only about maybe five hands went up in the whole audience, right? So there's about a thousand men, let's say mm. about five men raised their hands. And then the facilitator said, okay, now all of the women in the audience, how many of you have felt unsafe in the last week? Mm. A thousand hands went up and probably 1500 because a lot of women raised both hands. So mm. as to emphasize just yeah. how unsafe just in the last week they had uh, felt. And I remember that moment being such a revelation, despite growing up with three sisters, uh, having two moms and my mom mm. and my stepmom, like I, I really had insight into women's lives and yet somehow it had completely escaped me. Mm. That women overwhelmingly feel unsafe in the world mm. and that th there are certainly ways in which I feel unsafe sometimes, but boy, night and day experience. And that was foundational. That moment um, has been so informative for me as I've, uh, I was not coaching couples at that time. Uh, I, I don't even know if that was 2013. So I was just beginning my own, my, my, my journey as a coach and I hadn't started working with couples, but as I started to work with couples, that revelation has been foundational mm. in helping couples create safety and trust. Yeah. What's up Tate? Brian, why, man? I uh, th this this topic has been just floating around me and us over the last week, week and a half. I mean, it, it's almost like this topic of of safety and, and trust is embedded in in the lives of men and women in ways that we just just aren't aware of. To the point that you just made around that workshop, I was in that same workshop this past December. Same exercise, same activity. And I remember just being so blown away and totally unaware of how often women are walking around on a, on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, I had a, had an incredible conversation with a good friend this week. And, and she mentioned that when talking about this topic, when she gets onto an elevator, and there's a guy who walks onto the elevator with her. She makes a point not to push the floor that she's going to go up to until he presses the the floor because she doesn't want to be followed. And in this case, mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the week, she had been on an elevator. The guy came on afterwards, so she had already press, pressed her her mm -hmm. the number. And so she was present to his presence and he's like, oh, I'm on the same floor. And her, her radar goes up mm. at that point in time and gets off the elevator yeah. and yeah. is fumbling intentionally with her phones to one work, work phone, one business phone mm. to delay. She's like, oh, no, go ahead. And and then he gets off. She gets off. And then he's standing there waiting and she starts walking down and he starts walking behind and she's like conscious yeah. of this. Yeah. These are not thoughts. I, I travel all the time and these are not thoughts that go into my head and, and the pervasive nature by which safety and trust is ever present in the, in the minds of women is, is, is deeply painful to even realize yeah. just and one of the things that I've come to reflect on in this conversation is that, and th this is a part of the story that I might be making up, that I, but I believe that largely the, for women, this fear around safety and trust is largely physical, sexually related. 
um, maybe not entirely, but, but as I've been thinking more and more about this, the reality is that, that men also are struggling with not feeling safe. It just, we, we usually feel safe sexually and physically, but there's a whole host of other ways that we don't feel safe in the world also. So what I'm present to is how unsafe both men and women are as we try to come together into relationships. And it's, it's heartbreaking actually to really think about all that we're holding as we enter into relationships. One, one of the things that I just believe to be true is that getting into a relationship is, is one of the most courageous acts that, that men and women can have because each of us are bringing our own pain and suffering into a relationship and now trying to work it out between two couples. And not only that, everybody's walking into a new relationship with a hundred percent breakup rate prior to getting into that relationship. And so how do we be in relationship, holding what we're holding and create safety and trust for one another in ways that are, that matter, that, that can help us calm our nervous system. And it's, and nobody trains us how to do it. Well, I this subject that we're going to dive into today, cr creating safety and trust. Uh, and I, you know, you made a, you made a statement earlier and acknowledge that maybe it's a story you're making up that for women, it's predominantly sexually, physically un unsafe that, that they feel in the world. And what I will say is what I know about working with couples for many years is that mm. actually the overwhelming experience of a lack of safety that, that, that women have, except where even, well, oftentimes even when physical abuse abuses was present is actually mm. a lack of emotional safety. Mm. Yeah. Actually isn't physical at all. And this is, I think one of the things that really trips up men that no, I would never hit a woman. I would never hit her. She knows she's safe from me. Why the hell might she not feel safe with me? That's mm -hmm. like, it's a foreign concept. It certainly was for me for a long, long, long time. I knew I was never going to hit a woman. Yeah. So it didn't even occur to me that she might not feel safe yeah. in some way. And yeah. to your yeah. point, it also didn't occur to me that I didn't feel safe Yeah. in yeah. various ways. Yeah. So this, this is yeah. a profound conversation that I'm looking forward to unpacking with you. Well, what I'm present to as you're, as you're saying that is, is thinking about all the reasons and why, you know, all the, some of the backstory about why women don't feel safe. One, one, of, one of the things I'm present to is that, you know, think about all the men that have not really been trustable to women in their lives, whether or not it's their fathers that haven't been present and attuned to their needs or, boyfriends that have betrayed them or, or brothers that haven't had their back in some way, uh, boys making unwanted sexual advances on, on women, men who are more physically imposing the anger. I just, you know, owning up to one of the things that happens for me emotionally to the point that you were just making my anger, um, mm. can, can create a lack of safety employers that overlook women pass over them for opportunities because of, of them being women. Um, you know, they're, they're, so I think you just bring up a really powerful point that, that many women are coming into relationships, not feeling safe in large measure because they haven't had trustable men around them to help them feel safe. And in, in, in fact, it's actually been the opposite. And, and even men like the guy following your friend after the elevator, mm. I, my guess is he was clueless Yeah, that, totally. that might've made her feel uncomfortable. Totally. I, I remember, I remember a couple of years ago opening a door. I was at a hotel and I think I, I don't know. I think, Oh, uh, like maid service had come around. It was like the next morning. And, uh, um, uh, one of the, the housekeepers knocked on the door. I had just gotten out of the shower. So I'm just wearing a towel. I might've had a, probably had underwear on underneath it, but I remember answering the door without a shirt. And in my towel, and I'm just like, yo, I mean, I'm a, I'm just in my room doing my thing. I don't again, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. lack of safety was not yeah. on my mind. And I'll never forget mm. her visceral pullback. Mm. The oh, visceral wow. step back that she took when I opened the door in the way that I did. Uh, 
I mean, because again, I've, I've been paying attention to these things for many years, I, it immediately registered for me, holy shit, wow. she just felt unsafe with me. And yeah. <clears throat> again, you know, that that anger thing you described, I think a lot of men, again, we know we're, 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 we're not going to hit her. She's not in physical danger, but her nervous system doesn't yes. know that. Yes. Her primal body only knows the the evolutionary ex, you know eons yeah. of of men being able to just with the 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 swipe of a hairy hand to knock her out to kill yeah. her yeah so yeah. again yeah. On, on a very primal level there's so many things that we men are are unwittingly unknowingly innocently even doing i'm aware of that too if 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 i'm on a, a street and i'm and there's a woman like I'm walking on a sidewalk behind her, I'll either slow down to give her a lot more space. Mm. I might even cross the street so then I'm not trailing, but I'm so mindful of that. Yeah. And even if I'm making it up, I just know. So we're going to, let's dive into a little bit more about the ways that women don't feel safe. Yeah. Because again, men that are listening, I know for some of you, this may be a foreign concept. I mean, how many guys have we worked with Tate? Uh, both particularly in our, in our relational work for whom it is a, uh, a revelation Yeah, that, you know, we, we, we work with some men that are married for decades and who might be locked in, for example, like sexual dysfunction or disconnection, right? They're not on the same page sexually, but oftentimes he's wanting to have more sex or get more affection than she's wanting to offer. And, it doesn't even register to him for a moment that she might feel unsafe in some way. Or if she does express a lack of safety or trust, it just boggles his mind how that could be possible for her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think what we're, we're kind of, I'm, I'm just learning this as much as anybody else at this stage, you know, get, getting really present to there's, there's two factors that are always at play when, it, when, when I think about, how women and why women don't feel safe and, and, and trusting in a relationship. One is what we've been talking about, which is that the, the big long history of experiences that women have had over the course of their lifetime of that have trained her to wonder whether or not men are trustable. And then there are, there are things that when we are in relationship with women that we continue to do it, using our best intentions in some ways, but without knowing it, we continue to tap on that hurt, that wound of lack of trust and, and not knowing that we now play a part of a much longer story for women. And so how do we as men really get clear about, you know, we've talked about like three things that we do as men that really damage that just can destroy even the safety and trust inside of of relationships. And, and I think that what, you know, just to go, maybe this is where, where my mind was going, you know, one of the ways just that, that men can damage the safety and trust inside of, of relationships is, is really in the sexual or in the physical space, you know, and again, this is maybe more history here, but I, I had a conversation with my daughter this summer. She, she was 12 years old at the time. And I'll never forget her coming to me and asking me the question. She had a love interest at the time. My daughter has loved love forever. And she asked me at 12 years old this August, because there was a boy on the swim team that she had a crush on. And she asked me, dad, when are you going to let me start kissing? Which is just such a beautiful a, question yeah, for my question. daughter to be asking me. And I gave her an answer that my wife didn't love that I gave because we hadn't gotten on the same page. And my wife was of the up mind of like no dating at all. But I said to my daughter, you know, I don't I don't know that it's my job, Alexa, for me as your dad to tell you when you're ready to start dating. I, I will say that there's two things that I'm concerned about that I want you to be aware of. The, the first is that I don't want you to be the kind of girl that needs to constantly be validated by other boys so that you feel good about yourself. I don't want you to feel like you have to be in a relationship in order for your value to be 
um, what you want it to be in the world. So that's the first concern that I have for you, Alexa. And the second concern is that I don't want you to feel like you're ready for your first kiss. And the next thing you know, there's a boy's hands down your pants. And that is actually living out of, you know, there was a CDC study last year that I read that, that terrified me. And that is that 14% of teenage girls are, have reported being raped. 14%. And what I believe yeah. to be true is that that number is probably low. Yeah. But I was blown away by that. I was, I was even more blown away, not maybe not even more, but I was equally blown away by the fact that the World Health Organization, they conducted a, a multi-country study on women's health and domestic violence. And they found that up to 71% of women have reported experiencing unwanted physical or sexual advances in their lifetime. And that's just reported. Again, that's I, just reported. I'm surprised at how low that number is. So it's like when, when I, when I, when I really think about what, what is my job as a man in the world of a daughter of a now 13 year old, how do I, how do I help prepare her for a world in which 70 plus percent of the world is going to experience of, of women in, in some worlds, not every country necessarily, but, but many women, and then 14% of CDC in the United States are going to be raped. And how do I help protect my daughter? How do I help create safety and trust for her? And, and that study also went on to say that one third of all teenage girls experience suicidal ideation. So if not my daughter, then one of her two friends and what impact is there on her feeling of safety and trust when one of her friends is thinking about committing suicide? So I'm devastated by what women have to deal with in this space. And what, and what I think this is really important, not just for, for fathers of daughters, mm. but for men that are in relationships to women, yeah. this is what they are bringing into their experience yes. with you. Yes. This is, again, you could be perfect yeah, that's which right. no man ever is, but you could be absolutely <laughs> right. perfect for, you know, for, for, for at the beginning of the relationship, she's still bringing in mm. a nervous system that doesn't necessarily feel safe with you at every turn. Yeah. Right. And so I think this is of just vital importance because one of the things, so we have this, so the one distinction we want to dive into is the three ways that men destroy safety and trust. Yes. Don't worry, fellas. We'll also go into the three ways that women destroy safety and trust yes. because they That's ain't right. innocent either here. That's right. That's right. We, we got you. We got you. We see you. <laughs> uh, but we're going to start with the three ways men destroy safety and trust. Yeah. And we're starting with this, the, the, the sexual domain, the physical sexual domain, because this is what I was talking, talking about earlier. Some mm. of the men we've worked with who've been in relationships for decades in some cases and for decades, they have been orienting towards their wives as just a, as largely like a sexual tool that they can use from time to time, right? Orienting towards them as I provide, I provide resources, I provide money, I go to work, I do all the things. You should be giving me your body, right? They may not use those words exactly, but in some cases they kind of do even, right? So mm -hmm. we're communicating in ways, or maybe it's not spoken, maybe it's unspoken, right? The man who, who, who feels spurned uh, by his wife, his advances, she, he feels rejected. So he sulks and goes off and uses pornography mm. almost as a punishment potentially. Mm. Yeah. Right. Again, look, innocently done. I mean, I, I, I know that that we men even are only acting out of our own discomfort, our own pain in some cases, the pain of being rejected. For a lot of men, sex is is validation. Yeah. Our, our partner saying yes to sex means I feel validated. I am a man. I belong. She loves me. I mean, there's a lot at stake here. Well, and, and there's and there's even the chemical components of oxytocin right. that yeah. for in many ways, I think you've actually shared this that that women mm -hmm. can experience the exchange of oxytocin through having conversations right that the, the love chemical kicks on and for men it it doesn't become enlivened as much as it does 
as men have sex. That's when well, the love touch, chemical physical touch, touch we physical, physical touch, touch and affection to and intimacy yeah. at deeper levels. That's what happens. And so there are these things that are at play that, that aren't, um, I, I think, you know, men don't just want sex. We want to feel love and connection and we do feel that physically, but we, when we ignore what women are holding in this space yeah. and the history of abuse and unwanted sexual advances, when they don't feel open and they feel closed down just because we were feeling something in the moment and we're not attuning physically and sexually to see whether or not there's a receptivity and, and an openness, then we're, that's where we're, we're, we end up causing damage unintentionally. Right. So we could, we could say that like not making it safe for her to say no. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. Right. That's, that's yeah. one. Two is a lack of presence. Yeah. And we're what, one of the things that we're wanting to do with this episode is presence for men, all of the things that women are holding and, and uh, certainly on the pain side, but we also want to talk about the gifts that women are bringing Tate, bring us into that. Uh oh, I must have frozen for you. You did. <laughs> okay. So it's freezing okay. a lot, actually. <clears throat> You're not freezing at all for me. It's actually going okay for me on my side. But yeah, okay. I handed it off to you and, and you just de dead stared me. So let, let, let yeah, me start. Yeah. So this. set let, it up for start, me again. Let, let's start. Let's start. The, let's start over. Editors, just, catch just us. this section. <laughs> they, they'll get us. Just remember, we, we should check it. So the second way that men damage. Yeah safety and trust is just our lack of presence. Yeah. There's a lot we can say about this, but the, our lack of presence, as we've been describing so far, our lack of presence around just what is she even bringing? What is she holding? Mm. Yeah. Right? Our lack of, of being in the relationship. I talk a lot about masculine checkout syndrome, yeah. right? We check out, we're not physically, I mean, we are physically present, but we're not emotionally present or even mentally fully there. Yeah. We're, we're, we're checked out. Um, that causes a lack of safety and trust. Like, oh my God, he's not there for me. That's right. Top two complaints that the Gottman Institute identified. He's not there for me and there's not enough emotional connection. Right. So she's not feeling emotional safe. She's not feeling like you, he really has her back. Like he's really going to be there for her. Yeah. So lack of presence, but also take, take us into some of, of, of the other aspects of lacks of presence, like the gifts that women bring. Yeah. So I, th uh, you froze again there. Well, just take, take, so you're not freezing for me. I got you. Like I can't for hear you. whatever reason. Okay. I don't know what's going on. So, uh, I'll go into it now. So go into the second two, bullet. One. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, that I'm really aware of these days and, and I bit was blind to it for the first 10 years of my marriage is how much women are holding and, and truly how much women are the connective tissue in the family environment. Like when, when I'm not really present to all that my wife is holding as a professional woman in the world who is holding her work life together as a mother with an umbilical cord connection to our, our kids that is just doing everything in her power to lean into the kids, the connective tissue in the community of trying to make sure that our kids and our family are connected to people that really matter. The connective tissue of, of us really longing for us to be connected in, in ways that are, are meaningful that all, when I'm really present to now that I wasn't in the first 10 years of my life is everything that Elsa is doing on a daily basis in her mind and in her actions to make sure that everything is handled in her work life, her professional life, in her personal life, in her health life. And, and, and largely where I was just totally absent is acknowledging and appreciating all that my wife was doing on a daily basis to hold our family together. So, you know, one of the things that, that we lose the safety and trust is when we don't see and appreciate our partners for all that they're holding, mm -hmm. all that they're dealing with, all that they're doing. And the greatest thing that we can begin to do as men to rebuild trust, and we'll talk more about that, is to really see those things. And the first thing that we, well, the second thing that we talk about is when we're not present to that, how quickly 
we can be destroying the connection that's necessary because safety and trust is the foundation of every good relationship. I, I, the, the other thing that I'll just point out to here, and, and you actually found this article, uh, in the Washington post recently from a, a divorced woman who is now finding happiness. And one of the things that she pointed to there and, and presents this stat for us, and this is a stat that, that actually was quoted from 2015, that in 2015, 69% of all the divorces that are being initiated are being, were being initiated by women. That's mind blowing. It is mind blowing because what I'm present to is obviously over time, women have become more and more empowered to not stay stuck in relationships because of the financial insecurity that was caused by being in homes where the male was the only financial provider now in a culture where women are working as hard, if not harder than men and making more money in some cases, they now have the freedom of that. And when, when men go long periods of time without really seeing what, what women are holding and not being pr appreciated for that, you know, you wrote a blog about this. You should speak to this piece mm -hmm. about for men, we can, our presence, we can be present in the relationship and then be checking out. We talk about one of the hardest things there, there is for us to do as, as men is to show up and to stay showing up. We show up and then stop showing up. We show up and then stop showing up. And you wrote about this, that essentially men can leave many times, but a woman only leaves once. Mm -hmm. Speak to that a little yeah. bit here. Bring us into your thinking well, then and how this how this relates. That that 70% statistic that women initiate 70% of divorces is really mind blowing. I think it flies in the face of what what the, the stereotype that men tend to have of women that they they want to be in relationship. They live for marriage. <laughs> Every woman mm -hmm. wants to be married. Well, what yeah. the hell is going on that 70% then of divorces are being initiated by women? And so, yeah, I wrote a blog called Why a Man Can Leave Many Times, A Woman Only Leaves Once. It's actually an essay in my, my book, Choose Her Every Day or Leave Her. But that speaks to, you know, men, we can, we, because for, for many men, that core value is, is freedom. So we can, oh man, we feel trapped by our relationship. Oh, let me just go create a little freedom for myself. Whether that means playing some video games, jerking off to porn, or just even actually leaving, stepping out of the relationship for a while. I mean, that was a pattern I was in for about five years, that five-year relationship um, that I, I wrote about in Choose Her Every Day or Leave Her. I would leave, you go stay at my parents for a week. Oh, I feel so much better. Like, okay, I'm free of the of the trap I feel like I'm in when I'm, when I'm in the relationship. But once I'd feel free, I'd be like, Oh, well, look, I'd look, she's kind of cute. She's pretty sexy. I, yeah, we can figure this out. We got this. I'd go back into relationship where she was waiting for me. She, she hadn't left. I was the one that left and I could repeat that. Whereas every time I would do that, it was like <sighs> chopping at our connection, like chopping at the, the roots yeah. of our connection, like with an ax, just every time an ax blow chopping at the roots of connection. Every time I would check out, whether it meant going to stay mm. at my parents' place or just being like, fuck this, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to go, you know, spend the evening by myself, whatever. And eventually what happens is uh, when that, that the roots of connection have been chopped at so much, well, there comes a day. And obviously this isn't true for every man and every woman and every relationship, but pattern wise, you know, yeah. broad strokes here, she's done. When, yeah. when she can no longer, when the connection has been severed, yeah, she's done. Yeah. And that our lack of presence, I've worked with so many men. I've had men even in my family system who've been divorced by their wives. And, and the story they tell me is Brian, I, I didn't even know she was unhappy. Right. Yeah. Ugh. Mind blowing and tragic. Blindsided. Blindsided. So that's again, a way that we damage safety and trust just just a simple lack of yeah. presence to both yeah. what they're holding, the pain they're holding, and also the, the gifts that they are uh, to the world and to our lives. Third one, being dismissive. We men are so yeah. dismissive, so routinely in relationships. Mm. And I am just as guilty of this as any man has ever been the, <laughs> the, one of the things I, I like to talk about uh, in, in my work in the masculine feminine map of things is, is that the, the feminine fear, the core feminine fear is I'm crazy. 
the fear yeah. of like who I'm being is inappropriate, is not correct, is somehow wrong, off. The way that I'm being, my beingness is off. Now for men, or for the, I should say more for the masculine, because some women will identify with the masculine and men with the feminine, vice versa. And, and we all have both, but some men, or I'm sorry, the masculine fear is that I'm, 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 uh, I'm a fuck up. We'll talk about that when we get into the ways that women damage safety and trust, because boy, they like to go after that one. But the feminine fear, I'm crazy. And how do we men typically dismiss women's experiences? By saying they're crazy. She's crazy. She's yeah. making shit up. She doesn't know what she's yeah. talking about. And and dismissing their feelings and, and saying you shouldn't feel that way. And, mm -hmm. oh, she's feeling something. So I have to do something and fix something so she no longer feels those things. And I think some of that is just born out of the, our own makeup, which is that we've grown up thinking that our feelings, something is wrong if we're having feelings that it's not safe to have feelings that, that to, as a matter of fact, one of the, one of the things that we talk about is, is the, that the foundation of intimacy is intimacy with self before, uh, you know, intimacy with other. And one of the things that we experience as men is we're not really in tune with the body sensations that are happening in our body. We're not really in tune with the feelings that we have. I remember a decade ago when I started getting into men's work, how I needed a feelings wheel in front of me to be able to describe the actual feelings that I was <coughs> having because I have lived a life of actually numbing my feelings, changing my feelings, not being able to sit inside my feelings. And if I'm not able to sit inside my own feelings, of course, when my partner comes with her feelings, I can't be with that. So I just have to dismiss them and tell her that what she's feeling is not okay that she's feeling those because now it's starting to make me feel in a way that's uncomfortable. Right. So it's our inability to feel that then we dismiss the feelings of our partner. And when we're dismissing her feelings, she's she doesn't feel safe to be who she actually is in the relationship. So no wonder there's a breakdown in safety and trust, because I don't know how to be with my own feelings and I don't know how to be with hers. So let me just ignore this and see if that makes things better, which it yeah. never does. Nope, not in my experience. In fact, men, if you're listening, Ask yourself, how many times have you ever said these words to a woman? Your feelings matter to me. Your feelings matter to me. I can honestly say that at least into my 40s, into my early 40s, I had never said those words to a woman. Not once in my entire life. In fact, most of my communications had been quite the opposite. Hmm. Not, not, not your feelings don't matter to me, but I mean, look, there's even a, these days there's even a political movement. Fuck your feelings. Okay. That's not going to be very helpful, but yet that's the mm. stance that yeah. we all have commonly taken that yeah. again, destroys safety and trust. And by the way, not only, you know, ask yourself also, if you are in relationship to a woman or you have been imagine wonder, maybe even ask her how many times has she heard a man? Mm. say those words to her yeah. for most women that number is going to be zero yeah and yeah. for and those who have heard it it's they won't be able to they won't need more than one hand to count and, and and then ask the other question which is how often do they get the message you shouldn't be feeling like that you shouldn't feel that way That's you right. shouldn't be experiencing That's that Right. It's complete opposite. And so, you know, imagine a world and, 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 and we're going to talk about, you know, a tool later about what men can do to really lean in or, or really what couples can do as you, as a tool to really acknowledge what other people are going through, what your partner is going through that isn't inside the world of you shouldn't be feeling the way that you're feeling. So just stop feeling that. So, all right, guys, hopefully you're not feeling too beat up on right now. Uh, let's talk about the ways in which <laughs> the ways in which um, men also don't feel safe. The, again, this was a revelation to me, and I, I, I probably only started really understanding it as I was studying relationships in my in my late thirties when I yeah. was resolved to stop sucking at relationships. Okay, yeah, yeah, I wanted to understand what are the mistakes I'm making, but one of the one of the things that I was overlooking was I also don't feel safe That's regularly. Right. That's right. With or hadn't felt safe with women. And yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, as women are carrying in all the pain of their past inside of the reasons why they don't feel safe and secure in relationships, I, I think that there is one thing that, that, that every man is often carrying that, that, is a devastating reality for why he doesn't feel safe in the world. And that is largely that we as men in the world largely feel exiled. We feel alone in the world and that by and large, the message to us in order for us to belong, we must perform. And perform well. And we have to do well. And if we don't do well, if we don't perform well, then we don't get to be a part of the tribe. We don't get to belong. We have to perform financially and make enough money and provide. We have to provide and perform sexually to always be hard and last as long as we're supposed to do that. We have to be either emotionally stoic and not feel anything or to be able to feel everything, depending on what message we're getting, getting at the, at a point in time, we have to perform physically. We've got to show up and be strong and masculine and muscular and tall enough and good looking enough. I mean, the whole world tells men that you have to, as a matter of fact, I was just on the safari. I told you, you know, we went to Kruger national park for my 50th and I was, I was, I was blown away. Buffalo, wild Buffalo. Mm -hmm that when the men in the buffalo herds become so old that they can't really provide in the ways that they need to they are they are kicked out of the herd and they live the rest of their days they're mm. called daca bulls mm. the daca bulls are kicked out and they live the rest of their days alone and it's because wow. they don't perform that's that's in nature and that is what we are feeling and carrying in. So that's as backstory about, well, what then are the three things that women can do to destroy safety and trust in the world of men? And, well, and let, go ahead. But before we, before we dive into those, I want to, I yeah. want to yeah. still outline a few of the ways that the few, the things that men are carrying into relationships. Yeah. Right? So you're yeah. talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? You're talking about performance and what that lends itself to is we don't feel safe. We're not, it's not safe for us to make mistakes. That's right. We don't get to make mistakes. We have yeah. to yeah. be perfect in our, and, and perform well. And I think this also lends itself to our defensiveness when it, mm. when we feel like we're yes. making a mistake, uh, uh, can't, can't, we either collapse into shame. Oh, I'm a fuck up. I'm so bad. I'm a piece of shit. Or we guard with grandiosity. Fuck that. I didn't make a mistake. You made a mistake. You're seeing things, you know, et cetera, right? Yeah. And yeah. likewise, we also don't feel genuinely safe to even be honest. Mm. You know, to be honest. I mean, I, how many times have mm. I heard from past <laughs> girlfriends, hey, I just want you to tell me the truth. Yeah. Right. And then I tell them the truth. And they don't, they can't fucking handle it. They don't want, they, I just get blown. It blows yeah. up in my face. Right. Yeah. So that taught me that I'm not safe to tell the truth. Yeah. Not really. Which is why you wrote a whole book, uh, you know, tell the truth and let the peace fall where it may as that's a reminder a, right. of how do we, as, as men, really, I remember growing, I mean, my parents did the best they could and they tried very hard. And I remember them often saying, tell me the truth. But the subtext of that was, but we won't be able to handle it. Yeah. Tell me the truth. And that's, but we can't hold it. Yeah. So how do we show up inside of relationships where we're being told to tell them the truth and then, and then receiving a message that it's not okay for us to actually be thinking the things that we're thinking, to feel right. the things that we're feeling. Right. So right. that you're, you're, you're so, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So another way, another, uh, uh, what else we're bringing into relationship that causes us to, to not feel safe right from the start is, is lack of worthiness. Mm. shame yeah. so many men are carrying so much shame or or the experience of inadequacy yeah you know and i i because i've known some of these guys like even the guys that present as you know macho and and like i got my shit handled sometimes those are the most fragile men those are the men who on the inside feel the most inadequate so they have to cover it up with a with a mask of invulnerability yeah but the men come in feeling like I don't have enough money. I need to make more money to be worthy of love. 
I mean, that was a big story I had before I met my wife. It was a, a mindset that I had to work with. If, if, if I don't have money, no woman will love me. Mm. That was coursing through my, my whole psyche. It was the yeah. water I was swimming in. Um, physical strength, men not feeling strong enough in their bodies. We work, we've worked with men who likewise have grown up with the, the complex, like they're, they're, they don't have the muscles that other men have, and therefore they're less of a man less worthy of yeah, love, less yeah. attractive, uh, yeah. sexual performance and, and just a overall incompetence. So many men, because our fathers never showed us a wise path, <laughs> left us in many cases to just find our own way or oriented us towards things that don't fucking matter. We come into relationship clueless, mm. incompetent, feeling incompetent. I've heard from so many men, I don't know what she wants from me. I don't, I, I, I don't have what she wants. Yeah. So, you know, we men are bringing so much into relationship um, that is also a, a, a foundational, a foundation of a lack of safety. Yeah. So yeah. let's dive into the three ways that women destroy safety and trust, yeah. which, you know, play off a lot of the things that we're already carrying. Yeah. So, so number one is, uh, criticism and again, go back to this idea that for men, we identify through doing, we identify through performing and, and being well, you had this beautiful, uh, Q and a last night for the, the chooser every day or lever book. And, and what was really profound is that one of the, one of I guess a series of questions that women were asking about, like, how do I bring something to the guy if, without him feeling like he's not enough? Right. And one of the conversations that we really dove into around that is, well, first and foremost, to know that what a man is carrying is that he must perform and he must do it perfectly or else that he's going to have payback for it. And one of the things that I love is the definition that you've given around what criticism is. Why don't, why don't you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah. Criticism in my definition is very simple. It's direction given without being, uh, sorry, let me restate that. Criticism is direction given that isn't being asked for mm. yeah. to, direction given that is not being asked for. Yeah. That's and criticism. It, and, and it often sounds like you should do that. You never, you always, these are, these are the sentence stems that often men will hear. Why did you, or why didn't, didn't you, you yeah. right? These are, these are, th these are ways in which our, our, our partners are unskillfully talking to us about the things that we're doing and that immediately feel like, oh shit, I've done something wrong. And the reality is that, that we men carry in with us mother issues, father issues. And, and in doing so, what we hear in criticism is that our partners are taking a one-up position on us. Like, I'm better than you. I know better than you. You should listen to me. You're, you're, you're remember that, that, what you just said, men's fears, I, I'm a fuck up. Yeah. And if, if women come in with, a, with words of criticism and, and, and criticism is different than feedback. Criticism is telling somebody that, that they're wrong or what they did was wrong. Feedback is really about what impact that man is having on you and communicating in ways that allows a guy to hear a message that more sounds like this. Hey, I, I love you. I care about you. Uh, I have, I want to share something with you. You're not doing anything wrong, but I have something that I'd like to talk to you about that, that, that would be meaningful to me. Are you open to that? That, that's not criticism when it starts with a language like that, but most of the time we're not hearing it that way. Well, we had a, we had a guy on the, the Q and a last night who, who told us that his, his partner, his female partners would just use the word ouch mm. when he says right. something right. That, right. that doesn't feel good to her, that hurts her in some way when she just goes, ouch, Yeah, that's yeah. feedback. Criticism would be, you shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you say that? 
right? Again, the it, yeah. direction the, given the, that's the, not the being The Gottman asked for. Institute, who you, you referenced earlier, the, he, they have a conversation around what they call the four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse, which are what are the four actions that, that happen inside a relationship that are most likely going to lead to its demise? And the very first one is criticism. And, and criticism is the most common. It's the easiest thing for us to lean on. But criticism, what we what, what we really understand about is that it creates a barrier between the person giving the criticism and the person receiving it. It it creates a defensiveness. It creates resentment, and it and it feeds into this conversation of inadequacy. You know, the the reality is, you know. Sadly, this is true. I think we are men feel a lot more than we admit to, and we are more fragile than we'd like to believe. And it, and it, you know, we're the only sex that has to prove that we're the sex we are. We get the message, you're not man enough. And that you're not man enough could mean a whole host of things. So criticism is one of those things that's, that just starts to tear at the fabric of the safety and trust that men feel inside a relationship for who they are, for what they bring, for what they do, for who they are. And look, let's be clear. Obviously, men criticize women as well. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. All of these go go both ways. Yes, that's what we're, right. What we're drawing out are, are patterns yeah. that we see overwhelmingly. And and so we're, we're exploring the three ways that women tend to damage or destroy safety and trust. And this again, criticism goes right to the heart of, of most men's yeah. greatest fear that I'm a fuck up. Yes. And her criticism direction that she's given that he isn't asking for is just affirming, confirming him. Yep. I <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. So yeah. the second one is control. One of the things I like to talk about in my work is the masculine objection and the feminine objection. The, the feminine objection is don't mm. leave me alone in this. Don't abandon me in this. I, and we're not going to dive into that right now, but the masculine objection, don't tell me what to do. Don't control mm. me. Well, yeah. what is controlling behavior? Look, I was caught in this, in this cycle with that, that, that partner that I was with for five years because I had no idea about creating safety and trust. I had no idea how much I was damaging our connection. So almost probably daily through just the ways I was showing up in ignorance, she was feeling the lack of connection. She didn't know how to articulate that. Well, what it would come out as for her was try to control me, tell me what to do, hold on to me. I mean, I remember once when we would get into an argument, not once this happened over and over, we'd get into an argument. I'd want to leave because I knew this isn't, I, 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 I don't know what the hell to do here, what to say. There's, I'm trapped. This sucks. There's no right answer. I'm going to leave. Mm. She would walk to the door and lock that fucker oh, to man. not let me out. Oh. Talk about control. I mean, she would literally lock the door and then stand in front of it so I couldn't leave. Mm. So not fucking helpful. And again, now, and look, it was, it's, it, we were both, I like to say people, we people are, we're innocent in our ignorance. If we knew better, yeah. we'd do better. Yeah, I, I don't right. blame her or falter for, 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 for that. Certainly not now. I sure as hell did then, but that, the control, I don't feel safe to be who I am. I don't feel safe to be authentic. I don't feel safe to even have desire in a way, in a way that maybe my partner doesn't want me to desire. Right. Because of, I remember then with this, with this same partner, I remember getting, she got angry at me when I looked up at a billboard that had a woman's face on it. You know, the mm. billboard was doing what it's designed to do, which is get my attention. And I remember looking up at the billboard and she got so angry mm. at me for, and again, I understand now why she felt the disconnect in yeah. the moment that I gave yeah. another woman, even if it was on a, on a billboard, I gave another woman my attention. I already wasn't giving her the attention she was aching for. Yeah. But again, I'm clueless about all of this. All I'm yeah. feeling is she is telling me what to do through her yeah. way that she's the way the, the way that she is orienting. She's trying to control me, and I, I and I at the at what what I would say at the time is this fucking sucks. What I understand now is I did it did it did I didn't feel safe. Well, yeah, and and 
you know, you've talked about this. We've talked about this. One of the things that we talk about, are the, what are the fruits of a thriving relationship? The, one, one, the very first fruit is that you get to experience freedom, that you get to, you get choice in the matter. You have agency. You can explore the things that are interesting to you. You don't feel like you're having to walk around landmines and potholes and difficulties all the time. We want to be able to express who we are and what we think and, and all kinds of things. And to have that received without being controlled around those things, we need the fruit. And this is again, to your point, both partners need to feel like they have freedom inside of the relationship. Because look, if you're wanted and desired and you're respected, seen and appreciated, but you're not, you don't have freedom, you don't have agency, that's not a thriving relationship. So anytime a man is trying to control a woman or a woman is trying to control a man, it's the, it, it is one of the first signals that you're not in a thriving relationship. And there's some work that needs to be done to have you become more powerfully present and for you to have more skillful communication so that you can navigate the lack of freedom that is being offered and given and experienced by each partner. Yeah. So number three, the third way that women can destroy or damage safety and trust in relationship is to close down, mm. to withdraw love, withdraw yeah. affection, withdraw yeah. kindness, withdraw warmth. Now, women listening, I, this isn't a criticism of you. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not right just turning around and criticizing you or saying, <laughs> bad woman, you shouldn't do this. That's not what I'm saying at all. There, I understand. And there's why reasons women, why you're probably doing that, right? You're withdrawing well, that, your affection. Yeah. That That's it. I, I understand that for many women, shutting down is the only response to the lack of attunement, the lack yeah. of presence, the yes. being dismissed, etc. But what I really want to talk about here is th there's a difference between giving feedback, right? What Tate was talking about earlier, the difference between feedback and criticism. Feedback is essential, but a lot of what we're talking about is the closing down as punishment. Yeah. Feedback is essential. Punishment is parental. Mm. You know, this partner, this, the, the, the woman, and, and, and look, I have nothing but respect and love for her. And I know I, I'm not trying to throw her under the bus. I was, I was a monster myself in, in all kinds of ways, which I've written about. Um, but it's just, these are just teaching stories at this point for me, but the, this, this, the woman who would also lock the door and to keep me in for an argument when I wasn't in the room when I was somewhere else and I didn't give her what she wanted or didn't do what she wanted. She would totally shut me out. She would totally shut me out, ghost me, shut down on me again, just as if, as if I was dead to her and it was excruciatingly painful. And that shutdown, what happens for us men is again, it's interpreted. I'm not man enough. Mm. I did bad Therefore, I am bad, right? Shame. These are, again, the ways that we interpret as punishment for not being enough. Yeah. 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 So, look, I think that one of the things that we are trying to, to call out here are three unskillful ways that everybody's doing the best that they can, but are causing damage to the fabric of the relationship. And so what, what we need to do is move out of the ways in which we're creating damage, destroying even some of the safety and trust. And we need to move into a place of where, well, then how do you do it? How do you build safety and trust? How do we, how do we, you know, lean into the essential skills that we have and there are all kinds of ways that we need to learn how to stand in our power more. We need to learn curiosity questions so that we can help open each other's hearts around things. We need to be able to create healthy boundaries in skillful ways about what works and what doesn't work in relationship, right? We've got to navigate conflict in a way that we, we know how to and become masters of repair in relationship. And, and at the end of the day, there's a thousand things that, you know, we talk about this a lot in the elevate your relationship program where we give dozens of tools, but one of the things that we want to just bring to your awareness, uh, Tony Robbins, uh, who, who he, he has this quote that I absolutely love, which is that complexity is the enemy of execution. 
I have a tendency in my life to make things very complicated and to try to figure out how to do things in, in a complex way, which means yeah. that I very rarely will consistently over time implement complex things. Yeah. Yeah. So we've created a tool and we call it three steps to connect. There are also three steps that help rebuild safety and trust. And Brian, why don't you bring us in to just introduce that tool yeah. at least? Yeah. Well, one thing I, I will, I often say in relationship work is look, this stuff is actually quite simple, mm. but it ain't easy. Yeah. And the only reason it ain't easy is because we're not practiced. Right. Right. But it is so, so much of relationship work is actually much easier than yes. any of us ever realizes. And it's just tragic that, that nobody teaches us these things. So uh, to, to Tate's point, we, we, in our elevate your relationship program, which is, you know, it, it is a coaching program for men. There's so much curriculum. There's so many tools and practices, but it's also a men's group yeah. for men. It's a place where we men get to come together and talk about the things that matter most to us on, on our own journeys, each our own individual journeys to thriving in relationship and creating thriving relationships. So we're going to share with you one of the tools right now that we call three steps to connect. And it's very, it's three simple steps. Simple, not easy, but simple. <laughs> we try to make it easy. We try to break it down so it's easy. Yeah, right. But step number one, whenever you're in a, uh, when, when a disagreement or emotion arises, right? Your partner comes to you with some upset. Step number one, acknowledge. Just acknowledge what is in the moment. And the, in this moment is upset. Agno we have to be able to acknowledge just, and that can just sound like, babe, I really get that you're angry right now. I really get that you're, you're, that you're, you're I, I can see that you're pissed, right? You just start there. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can acknowledge, but it could just be as simple as acknowledging what you're seeing in front of you. Not, you see, most of us, we go, right, men, we, we tend to dismiss, women will tend to criticize. Yeah. Just go right to those, right? Which yeah. just cr destroys safety and trust. So rather acknowledge. It could also sound like, like, babe, I know you're doing the best you, you know how to do. I yeah. know you mean well for us. I know you want to, I know you want our relationship to succeed. I, right? I, That's I, see, a, I see how hard you're working. I, I, yeah. I, I so, I so appreciate everything that you're doing. I, I'm, right. I, I see you. I appreciate you. I, That's it. Right. I acknowledge that. Oh, it, it seems like you feel insecure. It, it seems like you don't, you don't trust me. It seems like that we, we've got a lack of safety going on. I just acknowledge the truth of what you see happening in the moment and not just bypass it to, to say you shouldn't feel that way. No, it's, I, I right. see that this is present for us. We're, I see that we're struggling. I see we're, we're having a difficult moment together. Right. So again, acknowledge is just being willing to acknowledge what is happening in the moment, what's present. The second step is reassure. Again, so few of us know how to reassure and reassure can just sound like, mm. I, I love you. I'm with you. I promise you that I, I'm committed to getting through this together. You're or not I alone could, in this. You, you, or it could sound like on the other side, like on the, if, if criticism is your go-to or the shutting down or, uh, what was that? What was the other one? Or controlling, like, I'm not trying to control you. I'm not yeah. trying to tell you what to do. That can be very reassuring words yes. Yes. that your partner might need to hear, right? I, I see your heart. I see all the things that you're doing. I see all the gifts you bring, right? So now we're reassuring where, where it's like we're speaking to the primal mind. Hey, you're safe with me. You're safe. I'm on your side. We're on the same side. We're not yeah. enemies here. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm partnered with you in this, right? This is all about creating safety and trust. So acknowledging what is, what's, what's happening in the moment, be uh, reassures, number two, re, be reassuring. I love you, of your love, of your presence, of your connection, of, of you seeing their good heart. And then the step three is, is be curious. Hmm. Now you can be curious. What's, what is this really about? What is it that you're really asking me for? What, yeah. what, <clears throat> you know, help me understand, help me understand what was going on for you when you did that thing that, that really hurt me. 
Yeah. Right now, you, now we're, now we're connected, right? Acknowledging and reassuring. And by the way, I think this is important to say, acknowledging does not mean agreeing with so many men get tripped up over this and think that acknowledging means agreeing with the reasons for it. It does not mean that. In fact, sometimes acknowledging can sound like, look, I really get that this is pissing you off and that you're upset. I don't really understand why, but, but it's, but it's okay. You're allowed to feel that way. I love you. I'm, I'm committed to figuring this out right right now. I'm not really sure what's happening. I'm not even sure what I think about this. I need some time to process that can be acknowledging. Yeah. Right. And that can be sometimes can be very liberating, very helpful for us to have that recourse. It's just so important, especially for us men, we get tripped over that all the time. Yeah. And, but that, so one, acknowledge, two, reassure, three, now get curious. And now we can get into what's really underneath the need. Sometimes just listening is all that is wanted in that moment. Sometimes there's a yeah, real problem just, to the, be solved, but the the one thing I just want to introduce here in this, and this is this is a question, Brian, that I learned from you, which is sometimes the best curiosity question that we can ask after we acknowledge and reassure is, "Hey, what what would serve both of us in this moment? Yeah. What could, what could we both do in this moment that would would be of service to each other and to this relationship? What would serve we?" Because I think oftentimes one of the things that breaks down safety and trust is when one person has an agenda that they get what they want at the exclusion of what the other person wants. And this question of orienting the couple towards each other, hey, what, what could I do that would serve you and what could you do that would serve me and how can we serve each other is a, is a gift to restoring safety and trust to both people that know that the other person cares about and it matters to them that we walk through this together. So if you are a man listening to this, if this is meaningful to you, if this is useful to you, uh, consider joining Tate and I in Elevate Your Relationship. That is our, 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 our live coaching program. You get to work with us directly uh, for, for six months or, or beyond if you choose to continue with us. It's our inspired men's group as well of men all gathered around Elevating our relationships, men who care about their relationships, whether you're in a struggling relationship or you're wanting to to make sure your next relationship gets off to a good start. The, the only thing I want to add to that is at the very beginning um, of this, I, we mentioned that the most courageous thing that you can do in life, one of the most courageous things is to be in relationship. A step above that in terms of courage is actually to ask for help and to get help so that you can do better in relationship and so that you all can start to figure out how to thrive. So if you're ready to be courageous in that way, we want to support you. And you can do that. Just email us, reach out to either of us at Brian at men, this way.com. It's Brian with a Y at men, this way.com or Tate at men, this way. And Tate is T A I T at men, this way.com. Also, if you want, go watch our, our free introductory roadmap video. It gives you the roadmap to thriving in relationship. You can find that at training dot elevate relationship.com. It's training dot elevate relationship.com. All this will be in the show notes as well. Um, but as we wrap up Tate, my God, man, uh, we almost did this in an hour. It's remarkable. I can't believe it. Uh, I know you're. We're, There's we're, so we're, so many more things that we want to say, but I, you know, so grateful to the people out there that are listening and trying to figure out how to create safety and trust in their relationship for themselves, for their partners. Man, it's such a beautiful, courageous act to be in love. So, kudos to everybody listening. It is. And before you rush off this podcast into whatever other content or busyness is next, we challenge you to just take a few moments to reflect on what you've heard here. What is one insight that you're taking away with you from this conversation? What is maybe one simple action that you'll take as a result? Maybe you'll put into practice, just practice acknowledging. Even if you don't do all three steps, just practice, mm. it, practice acknowledging or practice reassuring your partner. Yeah. yeah. We'd really like to know. Again, feel free to reach out to us at brian at mendthisway.com and tate at mendthisway.com. Uh, 
could you get, come on, join us and elevate your relationship. It's magic. It's changing men's lives and, and the ripple effect into their families, into their, their, their partnerships. It's incredible. Women, if you're listening and you know a man that would be served by this, please share this episode, share the training video with mm -hmm. him. But, um, well, good to see you, brother. Saying. As good always, good to see you as always, man. <laughs> and, th and thank you so much everyone for joining us on yeah. men this way.